Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 105. My first episode since returning from two road trips, the Family History Expo in Mesa, Arizona, and the all-day seminar that I did on Google for the Whittier Area Genealogical Society in Southern California. And I'm only home for a short time because I am heading out to Salt Lake City for the Roots Tech Conference, which is going to run from February 10th through the 12th of 2011. And then almost immediately, I'm going to turn around and it's off to England for some family history research with my husband and then a speaking engagement at the Who Do You Think You Are live conference in London. So let's back up a little bit and talk a minute about the Family History Expo that was in Mesa, Arizona. That was a fantastic conference. There was just something in the air that weekend. I mean, I've been to many conferences and certainly many family history expos, which are always, of course, educational and they're fun, but this one had a really special energy about it. I think that it's because it's one of the longest running expos and it probably has a little more of a a seasoned, experienced audience. And it's really fun for everybody who goes, you know, when they can start seeing familiar faces. But there was also a fascinating slate of classes, and the exhibit hall was busy as usual. Um, Everywhere I went, people were smiling and excited about what they were learning. And in my keynote presentation, I challenged them to do a couple of things. First of all, I challenged them to sit up front. (laughs) I think that's important. They used to tell us that in school, didn't they? Sit up front. You stay awake, you can see everything, you can hear everything, and you can be more involved. And secondly, I challenge them to introduce themselves to the people sitting next to them. Uh, I have heard stories about people who have actually ended up realizing they're related to the person next to them, or that person has information or experience in a particular area that was exactly what they needed. So, you know, that's the whole benefit of going to a live conference is getting to meet live people in person. So introducing yourself to the person that you're sitting next to, of course, is a great way to go. And finally, I challenged them in the keynote um, presentation to attend classes that they normally wouldn't attend. You know, try new topics and let the presenters really lay out those topics and see how it might apply to their own research. You know, get outside the box. And everywhere I turned, people were doing just that. In fact, um, one woman came up to me after one of my classes, and she said that she had taken my advice during the presentation, and she attended some classes that were very new to her. And she said she would have never otherwise attended them. And she really felt like it had changed her life. That was the way she put it. Um, It changed how she was going to be doing her research, and she was so excited about what she had learned. And that is so wonderful to hear. And I love seeing folks spreading their wings a little bit, you know, Um, that's what you can really do at conferences. It's easy to get into ruts, isn't it? Uh, Even with family history. Sometimes it's those ruts that kind of butt us up against a brick wall. But at this year's expo, everybody was learning new tricks. Um, I taught four classes, one of which was the debut of my brand new class on creating a family history tour with Google Earth, which I was very excited about. Um, You should have seen the eyes light up when I started showing them the the wide range of examples of what these family history tours can do in Google Earth. I mean, they were just, I could just see the wheels turning and all those brains out there in the audience. And people walked out really pumped up to get to work. I also debuted my new book at the expo, The Genealogist's Google Toolbox. And I couldn't believe it. We were sold out by three o'clock the first day. (laughs) And we had to take orders after that. Um, Which if you attended the expo and you placed an order, rest assured, they've all been shipped out and they are well on their way. 
And I was really happy to hear from visitors to our booth that they were so excited to see that the book was so user friendly. One thing it is not is a boring read. That's for sure. (laughs) The book is laid out so that you can easily pick it up and not only find the answers that you need, but also the step by step directions and lots of pictures and images that show you exactly how to do it. That's the kind of book that I like. And I was really happy to get a thumbs up from the people at the expo who were picking it up and looking through it and, and buying their copies. I also had a chance to sit down with Dick Eastman of Eastman's online genealogy newsletter while at the expo. He was wandering around the expo halls, attending classes, and he was checking out the exhibit hall. You're going to love this interview because it's a no-nonsense explanation of cloud computing, online security, and a whole lot more. You know, Dick is always fun to talk tech with, and I even got to see a picture of his new grandbaby on his cell phone. It's amazing that we got any genealogy talk done with these two grandparents sitting there swapping pictures and stories of their precious little ones and our families. Um, But we did. That's going to be coming up on an episode here in the near future. So stay tuned for Dick Eastman coming up on the Genealogy Gems podcast. And I want to thank all the bloggers who were there at the expo who tweeted and posted about my activities at the expo, including genealogy blogger Colleen McHugh and James Tanner, who posted an article on his genealogy's star blog called Live from the Family History Expo in Arizona. Uh, And he talked about the keynote presentation that I gave there and about the podcast. I'll have a link to that article in the show notes. And oh, speaking of my grandson, his mommy, my daughter, Vienna, came with me to both Mesa and to Whittier. And so um, Davy's daddy and his grandpas were in charge both those weekends. So while they were having their second guy weekend together, Vienna and I headed down to the Whittier Area Genealogical Society, uh, better known as WAGS, where I was the speaker for an all day conference on Google. Yes. That was a blast. I think that Roger Mount and his folks at WAGS should give classes on how to hold genealogy seminars because they really have it down pat. In addition to my four presentations on Google, which consisted of, uh, we did ultimate Google search strategies. We did Google Earth for genealogy, Google Gems, and Google Tools. We covered things like Gmail and Google Books and all the different kinds of t- Google News Archive, uh, lots of great stuff. Showed them lots of wonderful tips. And uh, they had a hall with exhibitors. They had a ton of great door prizes, a wonderful lunch, and a really huge, enthusiastic group of genealogists. Um, and everything, I mean, everything all day long just ran like clockwork. Um, WAGS has around 180 or so members, and I I think about half of them are pretty active, which is pretty common and very similar, actually, to my local genealogy society. So it's not a huge group. It's a good-sized group, um, and certainly it's not a national organization, and yet they put on a full day of family history, which was not only, of course, a fundraiser for their organization, but it was a great value for those who attended Um, And I have to say, the response to the Google topics was phenomenal. For many of those who attended, it was um, brand new. You know, they really hadn't gotten involved in Google tools and certainly not thought about them for genealogy. And for some of them, they already had some experience with Google. And, you know, some of them were a little bit skeptical about um, being able to really learn much more about it. But in the end, it was rave reviews and everyone walked away with new skills and tools for their Google tool belt. Uh, In fact, I was even adding stuff the night before because a few new things had come out um, on Google and I was so excited to share it right then and there in class. I was able to put it in there the night before and we just covered as much as we possibly could have. So I just can't say enough about WAGs and and about how much fun Vienna and I had there and how rewarding it was to see this whole group just buzzing about what they had learned. It was really wonderful. So that's my news. And uh, there certainly has been a lot of new genealogy news uh, as ever in the last few weeks. So let's get to some of that. First up, the Illinois State Genealogical Society unveiled their new website, which features Illinois resources for genealogy researchers. The new ISGS website features links to 
of course, the current issue of the ISGS newsletter and archived copies back to 2008. Um, listings of ISGS events and, of course, events for Illinois genealogical societies, highlights of various ISGS projects and initiatives, um, free databases filled with information on Illinois ancestors, and a list of Illinois research resources. So you can check that out at ilgensoc.org. It's like ilgensoc.org. Next up, the U.S. National Archives Record Administration has been busier than ever. They have a new online public access prototype, and you can view a video demo of it at tiny.cc slash OPA1. That's O-P like Paul, A-1. In layman's terms, they've improved their search engines. That's what this is all about. I'll have a link to that video demo in the show notes. But here's a scoop from their press release. The online public access prototype is the public portal that provides access to digitized records and information about our records. It also provides a centralized means of searching multiple National Archives resources all at once. Currently, researchers perform separate searches in the Archival Research Catalog, the ARC, for catalog descriptions, histories, and biographies. Then you have to go to Access to Archival Databases, AAD, for electronic records, and, of course, archives.com. The new interface illustrates a streamlined search experience for users searching across all of these resources. The prototype currently contains 10.9 million permanent electronic records. Additionally, the prototype provides access to 1 million electronic records currently in the Electronic Records Archives, which are not available elsewhere online. The National Archives will add additional functionality in the coming year, including an image zooming feature that will enable users to zoom and pan our online holdings and social sharing through Facebook, Twitter, and other sites. So it sounds like not only is it quite an improvement, but it sounds like really a commitment on their part to getting those digital records online and easily accessible. So you got to love that. And NARA is asking for public feedback because they want to make sure that what they're creating is a user-friendly search and display. So you can go try it out at archives.gov slash research slash search and send your comments and your feedback to search at nara.gov. And be sure and visit the show notes for this podcast episode because I have a video there that introduces you to the new NARA search. To get to the show notes, all you got to do is just go to genealogygems.com, click podcast in the menu, and follow those links to episode number 104. Also new at the National Archives is their first mobile app. It's called Today's Document. You can find it at tiny.cc slash todaydoc1. The app allows you to explore American history and what they call an interactive gallery of 365 of the most fascinating documents and photographs from the extensive collection of the National Archives. With the Today's Document application, you can learn what happened on your birthday or some other significant day of the year, or maybe in a, the day that uh, an ancestor was born, you can go and check and see what kind of uh, documents they have on that particular day. You can search for a document by keyword, or just leisurely browse through historical highlights from the National Archives holdings. The app allows you to zoom in on the high resolution images to get a closer look at the featured document and photographs, use the calendar feature to select a specific date, or you can choose Surprise Me to show a document at random. You can also learn more by tapping the, um, I, the info icon that you find there to read background information on the selection that you're looking at. And you can share these items via email, Facebook, and Twitter, and add documents to your favorites list by tapping the star icon. So I'll have, again, another brief tutorial video for you in the show notes to show you how to use the new Today's Document application, and that's going to be there in the show notes for you. And best of all, the Today's Document is absolutely free, and you can get it at the Android Marketplace and in the Apple iTunes Store. Um, I downloaded it to my iPod Touch, and it's really pretty neat. 
However, because it's so new, it did require me to download the newest iPod updates in order for it to run properly. So if you have any trouble with it, once you download it, just check for updates for the mobile device that you're using it on and chances are that'll get it up and running. And speaking of National Archives, the Library and Archives Canada recently announced that within the next seven years, get this, Library and Archives Canada will put most of its services online, which they say will transform them into a fully engaged digital organization, just in time to celebrate Confederation's 150th anniversary in 2017. Can you believe that the Library and Archives Canada sends out about 750,000 photocopies each year in response to their clients' requests? And of course, nowadays, their customers are now requesting digital copies. So they've decided that to be able to better respond and be able to contribute to the preservation of, of Canada's heritage, they will fill customer requests for digital copies of documents in their collection and paper copies will be phased out by April 2011. So that's coming up pretty quick. Um, their press release here says that the digitized documents will be made available through LAC's website for repeat requests. And by 2012, LAC will start responding to access to information requests by producing digitized records for clients. Also, podcast listener Donna Gage, she sent me a message on Facebook about another update at the National Archives Canada that she was very happy about. Effective February 8th of 2011, the Archives of Ontario extended its hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays to 8 o'clock p.m. and on Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Select services will be available during those extended hours, including registration, uh, reference services, microfilm viewing and printing, and viewing of previously ordered materials. Orders placed during extended hours are processed the next day, and the gallery exhibit will also be open. So thank you, Donna. She was very excited about that and wanted to make sure that we got the word out to all of you doing research up there in Canada. And in Ancestry news, Ancestry's Export Connect service has been, well, disconnected. <laughs> you know, I never really got in there and explored the Export Connect service, but um, it's a service that Ancestry created about a year ago. And they said they wanted to expand their service offerings and provide additional assistance for members through an elite group of professional genealogists and researchers. So you could hire genealogists to retrieve records, perform research, or simply get expert advice. In their formal announcement of the disconnecting of Expert Connect, Ancestry says that though this service has been a positive experience, Ancestry.com has decided to focus on other business priorities. So as of March 18th of 2011, Expert Connect will no longer be a service that Ancestry.com will offer its members. Both experts and members currently involved in Expert Connect have been notified of this update, and they say, we encourage members to finish out existing projects with experts they have located through the Expert Connect service, and if needed, continue relationships for future projects they may have. Hmm, could this have something to do with Ancestry acquiring Pro Genealogists not long ago, <laughs> which is a genealogy consulting firm? Uh, it kind of looks that way to me. It kind of looks like that you know, rather than connecting their customers to consultants, they are moving in the direction of keeping those customers for all aspects of family history, including professional search. So we'll just have to wait and see how it all unfolds, but I'll, I'll keep you up to date here on the podcast. And also new at Ancestry, they have released a new iPad app. It's called, aptly enough, Ancestry. And it lets you update and share family trees, old photographs, and records. And that app is free and it's compatible with the iPad, iPhone, and the iPod Touch. And speaking of apps, podcast listener Jenna Mills wrote in saying that the recent episodes of the Genealogy Gems podcast weren't showing up on her Genealogy Gems Android app. So if this happens to you, it might be because a more current version of the app has been released. You know, they're always updating the apps and trying to keep the technology up. So there's lots of updates. So simply check for the app update on your mobile device, download it, and you'll be up and running again, just like Jenna was. 
And of course, in addition to our Genealogy Gems Android app, which is available in the Android Marketplace, we have an iPhone and iPod Touch app uh, that you can find in the iTunes Store, which is actually doing very well. It's right up there at the top of the list, and we're happy to be a part of um, the app world, if you will, the mobile world. Everything seems to be going that direction. And finally, I want to let you know that I am very happy to announce that Roots Magic is once again going to be sponsoring the Genealogy Gems podcast for 2011. Um, they have been such great supporters of the show, and truly, I can't think of a higher quality genealogy product, and I am really, really proud to be associated with them. You know, at the Family History Expo in Mesa, Roots Magic was holding free classes for their customers right there in their booth. It, it was terrific. I mean, that's the kind of company that they are. And Bruce Busby and his team do that at many of the conferences that they attend throughout the year. Um, and in the case of the expos, of course, it's terrific because the exhibit hall is free. And so you can just stop by and sit in on some great free educational opportunities right there at the Roots Magic booth so that you can really learn how to get the most out of the Roots Magic products like um, Roots Magic, Family Historian, Family Atlas, and uh, the Family Reunion Organizer. But of course, not everybody can get to an expo or a conference, but Roots Magic has taken care of that too. You're never gonna be left behind if you use Roots Magic because they are now offering free online webinar classes to their users. So just go to rootsmagic.com slash webinars and click on a webinar title there from the list for more information or to register. And don't worry if you missed out on a webinar or the timing wasn't quite right for your schedule because you can watch or download past webinars right there from their website. Like uh, getting started with Roots Magic, publishing a family history with Roots Magic, family search made easy with Roots Magic, Roots Magic to go, running Roots Magic on a flash drive, and sources, citations, and documentation with Roots Magic. Oh, that's one that you gotta watch. Again, go to rootsmagic.com slash webinars. And this month, February of 2011, there are several new webinars coming up that you could attend live. First one is working with files and folders in Roots Magic. That's going to be on Tuesday, February 8th of 2011. 5 p.m. Mountain Time, and we'll run about 90 minutes. Then on Friday, February 18th of 2011, at 3 o'clock Mountain Time, cleaning your family tree in Roots Magic. Ah, we all need that, a good cleaning of our tree. And of course, they want to help you keep things nice and tidy and easy to find. That's going to be, again, February 18th. It's going to run about 90 minutes. And finally, Personal Historian, Bringing Life to Your Life Stories. Wednesday, February 23rd, 2011 at 5 p.m. Mountain, 4 p.m. Pacific. That's going to run 90 minutes. So I'll say it again. Roots Magic not only offers terrific products for family historians, but they provide you with the support that you need to get the most out of them and really move your research forward. So for more information, visit rootsmagic.com. And of course, tell them that you heard about it here on the Genealogy Gems podcast. All right, well, it's time to hear from you and we're gonna do that here in the mailbox. I have all kinds of stuff. You guys have been really busy out there. Now, we were just talking about Roots Magic, and Brant Gibson wrote in with some questions about using Roots Magic. He writes, I've got the full version of Roots Magic 4, and I really like the software and plan to keep it for the foreseeable future. However, when I brought over all my information from Personal Ancestral File, which I've been using for about 10 years, all my sources came over as free form. Do you think I should take the time to convert all my sources, which number several hundred, into actual census, directory, and other record types. I wanna be as accurate as I can, but I also have time constraints on my research time and don't wanna spend months on a project that may, in the long run, not be as useful as it first seems. Any advice would be great. Well, of course, I went to the source, and that is Bruce Busby of rootsmagic.com, and he sent me back a quick reply. Bruce says, it isn't necessary to convert free form sources to templated sources unless you want to. 
They will work perfectly well as free form and are quite a bit of work to convert. If it was me, I would probably only convert sources for people I worked on a lot, and then only if they needed to be in a template format. So a great question, Brant, and thank you so much, Bruce Busby over at Roots Magic for providing the answer. Next, I have an email here from Bill Buchanan, who writes in about some of the new Google Books features that we've been talking about recently here on the podcast. He says, after listening to your podcast number 103, I went to google.com slash books and I did a search on Buchanan genealogy. I found that I could download PDF copies of the books by clicking the read on your device link, then scrolling down to download PDF. And for me, this will be much handier than having to sign into google.com slash books each time that I want to resume reading. I always appreciate your gems. Well, Bill is absolutely right. The PDF is a great way to read a book that you find in Google Books. And then you also don't have to be online because you're reading it right there from your computer. Um, also, on that Read Your Device page, you can get apps for reading your books on your Android, iPhone, or iPad. And you can read them on devices like the Sony e-reader or Barnes & Noble Nook. Um, once you've downloaded the required file and then you transfer it to your device. And so you can just follow the instructions that are linked right there on that page and that'll get you all set up. And Kim Fillmore has also been finding some Google Books gems. She writes, I started researching my family tree several years ago. I'm a practicing OBGYN and I had really hit a roadblock with my great great grandfather. He was Jewish, and again, everyone told me that he changed his name when he came to the United States. I decided to back up and look at the history of San Francisco in 1905, which is where I thought he would be. In Google Books, I found his name, and yes, it was the original name. I also found where his son had also started a company and had merged with two other companies that I wasn't aware of. I found all of this in the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce and San Francisco Business Journal on Google Books. It opened a whole new avenue for me to investigate. I continue to look for more information about my great great grandfather and more details, but Google Books helped me break down my wall. I'm going to go to the San Francisco History Museum in between delivering babies. I love your show and listen to it at night. I used to listen to audiobooks to help me fall asleep. I can't fall asleep with your podcast. I just have to listen to it. Such problems. <laughs> well, I am so sorry about that, Kimberly, about keeping you awake at night. But that is fantastic news about your fines. And even though I can't deliver much deserved sleep, I will keep delivering genealogy gems. <laughs> and I wish you great success in not only your family history, but in delivering those precious babies, our next generation. Thank you so much for writing. And of course, I got to say, shameless plug, there's a whole section on using Google Books in the new book, in my new book, um, the Genealogist Google Toolbox. You can find that at googleforgenealogy.com. You can use the number four, you can spell out F-O-R, but it's googleforgenealogy.com. And there's a whole chapter on there, um, lots of great tips for getting the most out of Google Books. Thanks so much for writing, Kim. And next, I have an email here from new blogger Tim Jones of Wisconsin, who writes, Dear Lisa, I want to tell you how much I've enjoyed listening to your Genealogy Gems podcast. I've listened to the first 30 and the last 10, and I'm sort of working my way to the middle. I almost always learn something new, even when you're discussing a topic that I think that I know a lot about. I actually heard you first on the Genealogy Guys podcast, then discovered the Family History podcast that you did for PersonalLifeMedia.com. Thanks to your episodes 40 and 42 of that podcast, I started my own blog, My Georgia Roots at MyGeorgiaRoots.blogspot.com. I started in January about my long distance genealogical research. You said you wanted to know if any of us followed up on that and start our own blogs. I'm trying to stick to it on a twice a week schedule, weekend and midweek, and have 10 posts up so far. It does get easier somewhat once I get started, and I find that if I haven't even started writing by Thursday morning for the midweek post, I feel guilty about it. <laughs> I guess that's a good sign. Anyway, thank you again and keep up the good work. Hopefully I'll get caught up with the podcast this month. 
Well, Tim, I checked out your My Georgia Roots blog, and I have to say I was very impressed at how comprehensive your blog posts are. Um, You're doing a great job of sharing your research and including those images and those links to all those resources that you're using. Very well done. That is the way to go. Then another genealogy blogger wrote in, Cheryl Goble of Western Australia, who writes the Skeletons in the Cupboard blog at Cheryl, and it's S-H-E-R-Y-L-S dash Skeletons in the Cupboard dot blogspot dot com. I came across your podcasts about six months ago. I listened to one or two, and then I loved them so much, I downloaded all of them. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Um, because of you, I have created my own blog, which is Cheryl's Skeletons in the Cupboard blog, dot blogspot dot com. And now it comes up in Google if you search one of my family names. I am slowly adding posts to it. My next step is to work out how to do a website. I've also just listened to your episode on how to set up my iGoogle page, and I've done so very easily. I never knew that existed. I love listening to your podcasts. They are so helpful. Keep on the great work. Well, thanks so much, Cheryl, for your kind words. I really appreciate that. I love, you guys are so nice, and I love getting these emails. Um, And I have to say, I love, Cheryl, your Picasso slideshow that you have there at the top of your blog. Um, I love old family photos, and that is a really nice touch, having those just kind of gently slide by. Um, Really cool. So you have to check out Cheryl's blog, and I'll have both of those blogs with links on the show notes so that you can go check them out, see what your fellow podcast listeners are up to. Next questions about the Genealogy Gems toolbar. Um, Debbie Cook from Southern California, who I actually had a chance to meet in person at the WAG seminar. Hi, Debbie. Um, She wrote in about the search box on the toolbar. She writes, your toolbar search engine default has somehow changed to Bing. Now, Bing is Microsoft's Um, search engine. It's kind of the Microsoft answer to Google. She says, is there a way to change that setting back to Google? I've read your troubleshooting page, but couldn't resolve the issue. Well, Debbie, it turns out that the company who um, develops and maintains the toolbar for us has signed, yes, a new contract with Microsoft and has now made Bing the default search engine for the search box. Microsoft is really getting out there and giving Google a run for its money in terms of um, partnering with companies out there. So for for several different reasons, the company um, who makes the toolbar thought, you know, that that was the way to go. Now, I've emailed them to find out if there's any way to change it permanently back to Google for the Genealogy Gems toolbar. Uh, Not sure if that's so possible, though. But as a workaround, I do have an option for you. On the far left-hand side of the of the toolbar, and of course, this is our free Genealogy Gems toolbar. If you go to genealogygems.com and, and scroll down the page a little bit, that home page, you'll find the bar across the bottom, and you can just click it. Uh, it's just one or two clicks, and you can download it and add it to your browser. It's got lots of neat genealogy features, as well as a media player, so that you can listen to all three of the different podcasts that I'm involved in right there from your browser. You don't have to go to the web page. You don't have to go to iTunes. You can just listen as you're browsing the web. So um, on the left hand end of that toolbar, once it's on your browser, click on the down arrow to the right of, well, it's just to the right of that Genealogy Gems family button there on the left hand side. There's a little arrow. And then when you click that, it'll give you a drop down. Just select Refresh Toolbar. Then click on the small black down arrow to the right of the search box that's in the t- in the toolbar and select Google. It's at the very top of the list. The search box will then be a Google search box. But just keep in mind that if you do open a new browser window, you might need to go back and select Google again for the search box for that particular browser window. Um, but after doing that, then all of your searches, of course, will be for Google. And there's actually a couple of other custom searches that I've added there as well. So you might play around with that. There's a couple of different ways that you can um, specifically search using that that box. But the very first option will reset it back to Google as long as you're using the same um, browser window. But, you know, I'm going to be exploring more with Bing because I have been hearing some, hearing some very good things about the quality of their searches. I don't think they're their user interface, you know, the page, the web page itself, I don't think that's 
as uh, robust, if you will, as Google's is with the search option column and all that stuff. But I do hear and, and I have noticed that their search results are actually quite good. So um, maybe we'll cover more of that here on the show. And, and you can certainly, as I always recommend, use as many different searches as you can when you're really trying to find something because you do end up with different results, don't you, sometimes with these different search engines. So if you don't find it with one, you might just find it with the other. And finally, a uh, listener wrote in to share a family history article. This is from Rick Rissmiller. And he says, I hope you enjoyed the holidays with that grandson. Yes, I did. Oh, it was wonderful. Uh, He says, my wife Eileen and I had the greatest time spoiling our 14-month-old, born October 10th of 2009, grandson Ethan Uh, and uh, Rick was so sweet he sent me some pictures of his grandson and he's adorable look grandparents I'll I'll swap pictures with you (laughs) email me your grandkids I love seeing these little cute chubby chubby faces they're so adorable anyway so we were swapping pictures and I was enjoying seeing Rick's grandson and he says I was able to get through your awesome Google Earth for genealogy DVDs over the holiday and caught up on all the genealogy gems in Family Tree Magazine podcasts. Wow, you were busy. Oh, he did this while he was working on remodeling his garage. (laughs) That's a good way to listen to the show. Get lots done that way. Um, He says, I have not had the opportunity to attend a conference, but have that as a goal for this year, along with meeting you in person. Also hope to be a premium member soon. I thought you might be interested that in this past Sunday's Parade Magazine insert of our local Sunday newspaper, an article was called Reboot for the New Year, and it listed Track Down Your Forefathers as one of the top 10 things to accomplish in 2011. Lisa, I really enjoy your style of communication and how enjoyable you are making my search of our family's ancestors. Keep up the excellent work. Well, Rick, I'm so glad that you are enjoying the show, and I'm very happy that I could keep you company as you remodeled your garage. If only I could podcast and get that much done at the same time. Wouldn't that be great? (laughs) Um, My husband and I actually reorganized all of the Christmas decoration storage boxes that we had in our garage. That whole area got revamped this year. Um, But that was exhausting enough. I didn't tackle the entire garage. And thank you very much for sharing the article because it is always nice to see that family history is listed as a priority, isn't it? And thanks for taking the time to write. I I really enjoy hearing from you and all the listeners out there. Uh, Thank you for sharing your adorable pictures and passing along such encouraging words. And I hope that if you attend the uh, Ohio Genealogical Conference, looks like you're out there in the Midwest, um, definitely stop by and say hi. I'm going to be at the Ohio Genealogical Society Conference this year. Uh, I think that's the end of March. I've got all those listed if you go to genealogygems.com. Click seminars in the uh, menu and you'll find my whole list of classes and different presentations I'm doing throughout the year listed there. Okay, well, coming up next, I have a genealogy gem for you. Josh Taylor of the New England Historic Genealogical Society is joining me here on the podcast for the first time to talk about the upcoming Roots Tech Conference and an interactive case study that his lucky students will be doing. And that's coming up next. D. Joshua Taylor, known as Josh, is a nationally known and recognized genealogical author, lecturer, and researcher. He's currently the Director of Education and Programs at the New England Historic Genealogical Society, and Joshua is a frequent speaker at genealogical societies, libraries, and other organizations throughout the U.S. He serves as the Vice President of Administration for FGS and is co-chair of the FGS ISGS 2011 National Conference. Joshua holds an MLS in Archival Management and a Master's in History from Simmons College. Well, even though he has all that to his credit, chances are you know Josh Taylor from his appearance on the Sarah Jessica Parker episode of the Who Do You Think You Are TV series in season one, where she learned about her ancestor who was accused of witchcraft in New England. Well, in this episode, he's going to talk about his upcoming um, presentations at the Roots Tech Conference and a really interesting interactive case study that his students will be involved in. So here's my conversation with Josh Taylor. 
Hi, Josh. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. It's great to be here. RootsTech is being promoted as a place to come and explore emerging technologies. And it sounds like your presentation, What Can I Find Online, an interactive case study, is going to offer just that kind of experience. So tell us, what will you be doing in that session? So we're actually going to be taking a family from the Midwest, um, and the goal is for the participants in the sessions to actually get a chance to do the research themselves. Um, what I'm hoping is that we're going to have someone who's actually a developer in technology sitting next to a genealogist. And, you know, it, feel free to cheat off each other's screens and see what you can find. Um, I know some people are going to head right to Ancestry or right to Family Search. You know, others might use Google, um, or they might, you know, search for some GenForm or some Roots web posts. Um, so it really is an experiment, in a way, of how people do research. And, you know, I'll kind of guide folks along throughout the hour. Um, and then at the end, we'll kind of conclude and we'll develop some points about how we do research online uh, as genealogists. Wow, you're a brave man. <laughs> this is, I mean, it sounds fascinating, but uh, I can just imagine all of the different directions people will be going. And I'm guessing that's part of what you're going to all be learning is the fact that we all do go in so many different directions. Exactly. I mean, that's, you know, it, it really, you know, how do we harness the Internet in that sense? And I'm interested to see if I get all, you know, because I'm, of course, trying to anticipate the direction folks will go. Um, so we'll, we'll see who stumps me <laughs> in that sense. And, you know, because there's all different pathways that you could choose. Um, so I do promise there'll be a resolution to the case at the end. So there will be an answer out there. Oh, wonderful. So there'll be something very specific that you're trying to have people locate and figure out. Absolutely, absolutely. There'll be a family that we're going to try and put together. Um, and we'll also sort of develop some other things that you might look at offline, things that aren't available that you might read about um, it is a, during the hour, but that you can't see online yet. Oh, great. Reminding us that there's a course that's just the tip of the iceberg, what we're finding online, that there's so much more. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you're encouraging folks, it sounds like, to bring their laptops with them, their iPhones. They're, they're going to be interactive right there using their technology? Yep. And we'll actually be in a computer lab for the session. Um, so if they want to use their own laptop, they're more than welcome to, but there will be computers there as well during the hour. Oh, fantastic. Well, now you mentioned about having developers sitting next to genealogists. Are you anticipating that Roots Tech will be attracting the non-genealogist. I mean, I know that we're, they're talking about they really want that merge to happen. What do you think the approach will be? How will we get those people in who could have some wonderful technology impact but aren't necessarily into genealogy? Yeah, um, I think a lot of it is in the programming that's offered. I mean, if you look at the schedule for Roots Tech, it's not all centered towards genealogists. Um, it's centered very heavily towards the development aspect. And I really think that a lot of developers are starting to realize that there is a market for genealogy now. Um, but they don't know what to create unless we tell them. Exactly. I'm thinking that there will be at least a couple who, you know, walk in. And if you get one or two, that, then it's a success. You know, that, that's, that's kind of the goal at the end of the day. Well, and they've got Dell involved, so they're going to be helping to get the word out to those people. And like you say, there is a market. And there's an insatiable desire. And, of course, family history <laughs> affects all of us. We're all potential customers of that, right? <laughs> It does. And the, the other interesting thing is watching how software can cross over for historical use. Um, if there's a historian doing research, genealogical use, um, there's a lot that could be developed out there that can actually hit multiple targets. Wonderful. Now, I'm curious, have you conducted this presentation in other scenarios, or is this the first time out? <laughs> so I've done it in other scenarios, um, but this is actually the first time where everyone's going to get a computer at the same time. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll see how, how that works. Um, but I have done it in other scenarios with actually kind of feeding them some of the documents on paper, um, but actually assigning out individual strategies to go after. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how this works next month. Oh, I think that would be really cool. Well, even if you're not sitting next to a developer, if you're sitting next to another genealogist, you're still going to see such different approaches to kind of where they head online. And this is just one of three classes you're doing, correct? Yep, that's right. So you've also got software forecast, what genealogists need for the future, and the power of the PDF, tools for every genealogist. Now, of course, both of those, I think, are very intriguing. You talk about the software forecast. We all know about genealogy software, databases, that type of thing. What other kinds of software are you thinking about? So I'm actually shooting for a pie-in-the-sky approach. Um, if I had the ultimate genealogy software program, 
what would it look like? What would I do with it? Um, you know, one thing I'm going to be talking about is flexibility and, you know, can you drag and drop images, for example, that might attach metadata with them so your source citation is automatically there in a database? Um, you know, c can we get maybe Ancestry and Family Search to agree on a common set that's kind of attached behind all images? Oh, wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, wh what kind of image software can you have within your um, genealogy software program to actually edit and crop images, um, enhance them, you know, identify them? So all, all those different elements that it's really a sky in the pie um, approach for that. Yeah, and to me, what would be really interesting about that as well is there's the the technology that deals with what we already have. But for me, it's I'm thinking about what is the technology that prompts us to suggest new directions to go in the research. I mean, that maybe, you know, can go out there and determine which databases are available and maybe identify, here's the ones, you know, that may really make a difference for your research. Yeah, I mean, you know, it'd be nice if we had software that was smarter than we were. Wouldn't that be amazing? You know, can software actually tell us when we enter a place that it's in 1831 that that county didn't exist yet? Yeah. And then pop up a history of it so that we can integrate that into our research. Well, I guess if that data was built into the database behind the engine, I guess it could. And then the power of PDF. Now, most of us think of converting like a Word document to a PDF, but are you suggesting then that there's a lot more that these little uh, PDF files can do for us? Yeah, you know, I'm going to be talking about um, automated indexing that can be done in some PDF files, um, security and bookmarks, and really how you can create a PDF file that really moves to the next level um, and actually becomes an interactive document versus just something you print out on a computer or look at on a screen. So that's what we're going to be talking about that hour. Wow, that's really interesting. I'm, I'm interested. You have such an a important role that you play there at the New England Historical Society. And how do you in the world do you find time? You know, because you have to be able to sit down and come up with what's the next new presentation. Tell us your secrets. I don't get a lot of sleep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, I can appreciate that. But it's, you know, the, the mind is always on. Um, and I, I'm always looking for potentials of how we can turn something into a benefit for genealogy. Okay, so here's my question for you now, because you talk about the mind is always on, I can very much identify with that. And certainly, as genealogists, you know, more options will pop up than our fingers can type into the computer at one time. What is your favorite technology tool that you use to capture the ideas at the point where you're not ready to jump on them yet? You, you know, you're still working on something else, but you want it captured so you can go back to it and pursue it later. So I love my iPhone for that because I write um, voice messages to myself or actually record voice messages to myself all the time. It's the easiest way for me to capture an idea. Um, and people think I'm talking to myself. <laughs> you know, at least I have it there at some point. Um, so I'm, I'm full of little, you know, 20 or 30 second messages, maybe the middle of the night or as, I'm, as I come out of a meeting and something occurs to me, I'll, I'll capture it so that way I have it for later. That's a great idea. I mean, I, I love the iPhone. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, okay, so now you've all heard it, folks. If you see Josh Taylor walking around the halls of Roots Tech and he looks like he's talking to himself, he's really just leaving a message for himself with the next new idea. Fantastic. Some people call in grocery lists. I call in genealogy. I, <laughs> same thing. Well, Josh, finally, I, I wanted to ask you about, you know, one of the slogans for the Roots Tech conference is that it's a chance to come and shape the future of family history. And that's kind of a tall order. What do you anticipate that that's going to look like as you're roaming the halls of the Salt Palace Convention Center? And how do you think we're actually really going to be able to shape the future of family history there? You know, I hope to see a lot of conversations happening. Um, you know, gen generally at a genealogy conference, you walk around and we see um, a very similar set of exhibitors talking with a very similar set of leaders or similar set of, of influencers. Um, by adding in, you know, Microsoft and Dell, and really working to attract the developers, um, Roots Tech is going to do something unique. It's going to give a brand new audience a chance to actually talk to genealogists. And, you know, it can be, I, I hope that it turns into an exploratory week for people, that they can go around, they can actually talk with people um, and give them their feedback, give them their ideas. I'm looking forward to seeing any new gadgets or software that people are coming out with. But really, I think it's, it's laying a foundation um, for, for what's going to happen. I mean, I, I hope there's an, another Roots Tech in 2012. Um, that actually can build on that foundation. Yeah. So I hope a, a lot of collaboration happens, a lot of ideas floating around, and then hopefully one or two people will grab onto an idea and, and see what see what they can do with it. I sure hope when I get there that I see little pods of chairs, you know, actual places that 
that say, come and sit down and talk to each other. Because sometimes, you know, we get in conference mode, we are beelining to the next class, and we think that's the that's the goal. But you're really saying that, that it goes beyond that. It's turning to the person next to you and saying, hi, and what are you up here for? Yeah, and that's actually one reason why I, I designed the, the interactive case study classes, because I wanted to give people a, a chance within an educational setting to actually talk and learn from one another. Because y- you learn best when you're in a group, I think, around other genealogists. Um, that's how you pick up on their ideas or their search techniques. So that's what we're going to try and try and do that hour. Absolutely. Well, having you here on the phone and knowing that you know you're considered a very innovative kind of forward-thinking person in the world of genealogy, I wanted to ask you. You know, people think of genealogy online today, and they're thinking of ancestry. That comes to mind. And yet, Family Search is the driving force and the organizer of Roots Tech. What do you think the future is going to look like? With Family Search, they're moving so quickly into so many different genealogical spaces, all with free offerings. Will the world of online kind of free and paid or- organizations collide? Or do you think in 10 years, they're both going to be just as strong or will they be different? <laughs> That's a tall order for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I actually think that we are unprepared for what we're going to see in 10 years. Um, the idea of, of cloud computing um, really hasn't hit genealogists yet. And, you know, if you look at free, you know, versus paid um, websites, there certainly is enough data to go around. Yeah. I mean, you know, I can walk into a courthouse and find 50% of the materials completely unmicrofilmed, which means that they're not even an initial step to becoming part of an online database somewhere. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I've said for a while that, you know, the the war, if you will, or, you know, who has what content, that's going to actually come to an end at some point. Um, You know, people are still going to be actively acquiring content, but it's going to depend on the quality of the data that's out there. Um, You know, how accessible is it? How searchable is it? How smart can we train um, our search engines to be to actually pick up on different data? What I would hope to see in the next 10 years is a form of collaboration where if I go online and want to research Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, I would be presented with a list of various resources that might include free or paid links, but that, that I actually have an idea of what's out there, I have an idea of the scope, before I actually start doing my research. So m- maybe a shift from, you know, we love to type a first name, last name, and click search, but mm-hmm. what if we shift it from a, you know, research goal perspective, where we're actually looking for records in a particular place, and then we're offered various things to search. So I, I think that's what we might see in the next five or ten years, um, But we'll certainly see the mass databases of names out there as well. Those aren't going to go away. But, yeah, talking about the whole picture, it's not just the goal is the name, but it's we may not even know for sure what the goal really should be because we don't know what the possible date is. Exactly. And if you approach from a first and last name, you know, if my ancestor's name is John Smith and he's recorded as Francis John Smith on a record, I'm going to miss him on my first Passover. You know, I'm going to really, really miss him um, unless I actually know what records that I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. And so what I hope to see is kind of that next level that helps to educate um, us about what the records we're looking at as we do our research. I love that idea. Yeah. So it's really, and and I have to agree with that. I think quality is going to be one of the defining factors. And um, it's got to be a healthy thing. And, and And you're also presenting the idea that it's not just going to be the data, the records, but it's going to be the way in which whoever the provider is, is allowing us and helping us to access them. Yes. I, I mean, you know, when I look at a microfilm versus an online, an online set of a microfilm, I still find myself going back to the microfilm because I like the way that it moves. You know, I like yeah. it from page to page to page. Yeah. If I'm looking at an index, I can see alternate spellings right on that same page. That necessarily isn't available to me through a database that links into a microfilm that's been scanned. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see if they can, they can change that a little. Well, wonderful. Well, I am really looking forward to Roots Tech. It's going to be so interesting to see how it all plays out. I encourage everyone listening to um, check out Josh Taylor's presentations in the, the agenda and the syllabus and check mark those because I think you really are going to have an opportunity to be part of the conversation about what's coming up in the future. And I really encourage you to check out those classes because I like the direction you're going. And that is really not just presenting, but encouraging the conversation. Thank you so much for being here on the Genealogy Gems podcast to have a conversation with us, Josh. 
Oh, <laughs> thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy day and joining me here for this episode of the Genealogy Gems podcast. And if you have yet to join the millions of blog readers out there, now is the time to start reading blogs um, because I am guest blogging for Diane Haddad, the managing editor at Family Tree Magazine and blogger at the Genealogy Insider blog, who just became a new mommy. She's taken some well-deserved time off. Um, so starting on February 3rd of 2011, I started doing some guest blogging on the Genealogy Insider blog, and I'll be doing that once a week for eight weeks. And I'm doing a series of tech tips articles on the Genealogy Insider blog. It's at blog.familytreemagazine.com slash insider. And while you're there, take a second to add that blog to your iGoogle homepage. You can do that by clicking the orange RSS button. It's on the blog. Uh, it's over on the left hand side. And then just click the plus Google button that you find there. And you're going to be able to follow the articles as they're published from the comfort of your own genealogy dashboard. And if you want to turn google.com into your own genealogy dashboard, that's just one of the many tools that we cover in my new book, The Genealogist's Google Toolbox. It's available at googleforgenealogy.com. And finally, I just finished up this morning um, interviewing Rosie O'Donnell, who is set to star in an upcoming episode of the Who Do You Think You Are TV series. So stay tuned to the podcast. And if you're a premium member, now's a great time to join because the most current premium episode right now is an interview with Lisa Kudrow, the executive producer of Who Do You Think You Are? And Vanessa Williams, who starred in the season two opening episode. Never a dull moment around here. <laughs> and I am trying to bring it to you as fast as I can. I asked Rosie um, a question about, you know, were there any ancestors who really spoke to her that just kind of stood out? And she told a really interesting story about kind of a mystery photograph of a woman that was in her home that nobody knew anything about. And I think that that mystery gets solved in this episode. So I love a good mystery. I don't know about you. So I am looking forward to actually hearing who that woman was. And I am uh, going to be heading off to London here in about a week to go to the Who Do You Think You Are live conference. Um, so if there's something that you really want to hear from the conference, drop me a line. I'm going to be doing some blogging for Genealogy Insider, um, posting some things on Facebook and getting things for the podcast. So if there is something that you would like to know specifically about there, maybe something on British research, that's the emphasis of this conference. Um, drop me a line at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com or leave a voicemail at 925-272-4021. Or, of course, you can post it on the Genealogy Gems podcast fan page. That's over at Facebook. And I'd love to have you join the fan page at, on Facebook because it's really turning out to be like the fastest way to get news out to you. That and the, the notifications um, feature that we have on our Genealogy Gems toolbar. Um, those two ways are really the, the ways to get the quickest news. So hope to see you over there at the um, Genealogy Gems fan page in Facebook. Well, thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon. 